we are talking about supply chain today. So we wanted to do some highlights around just COVID-19 and in general, like what that's looked like for our local food system this year and different stressors um, or opportunities that it's put um, for local food. Um, an update from North Iowa Fresh as far as the food hub and what that's been like this year. Um, Laura is going to share as far as a producer angle um, and a meat producer, what um, supply chain has looked like this year and especially with COVID-19. Um, Melissa is joining us from Simply Nourished and getting an update on that. And then a brief update about our Grow Eat Play campaign and how that can combine into um, local food demand. So <laughs> Andrea, do you want to start things off? We've been kind of designated, North Iowa Fresh has been designated as the um, food hub or the supply chain team leader. Um, however, I mean, other than what's going on with North Iowa Fresh itself, um, there hasn't been any more development, I guess, related to um, specific, you know, um, food hub related, other than, you know, some of the other updates you're going to hear about. But um, the team has not been active per se, but I can give you a little bit of updates about North Iowa Fresh itself. Um, we've had a really great year um, with sales. Uh, CSA boxes were up about 20% this year. Um, I would say we didn't see a giant spike uh, related to the pandemic that maybe some sites did in other, or some CSAs did in other parts of the state or the country. I know uh, I work with a food hub managers working group and I hear reports of other CSAs in the state that had uh, record years that they sold as many CSAs as they could handle and had to start turning people away or recommending them to other CSAs. And I don't believe that we saw that same increase up here in the same way because um, we haven't been a hot spot. Our communities um, up here generally have been somewhat stable with um, COVID-19 and um, we haven't had as much shortages in the grocery stores and I think as much fear or hesitation to go to the grocery stores um, as some of the other parts of the state because the places that have seen the really high increases in CSA sales have been like the Des Moines area and the Cedar Rapids um, and uh, Iowa City area and that those areas also if you if you think about farmers markets those areas also had their farmers markets shut down so I think people were looking for alternative ways of finding local food that maybe they were um, going outside of uh, you know their regular trip to the farmers market and looking for the CSA options um, but up here, our farmers markets were um, uh, active and live and in person, um, a little bit modified, but still people could go and shop there. So we did see um, an increase. We've seen increase in um, CSA sales over the, you know, since we started three years ago, each year we've had an increase. So that's pretty encouraging. We are planning for, um, again, about another 20% increase for next year. And we have fairly confident, good confidence that that's doable. Um, we think the CSA model, just in general people, um, it's still fairly new concept to people of North Iowa. Um, in other areas, it's been around for a long, long time and we've had very few um, CSA farms in this area. So it's still a pretty new um, and takes a lot of education as to what you're really gonna get when you join a CSA and, and how it all works and why you have to pay up front and all of that. So um, we are working on updating our website and our social media plan to do better outreach around that. Um, another big part of our increased sales was the farm to school. We, there was some grant money that went out um, in September, October timeframe uh, to the schools, to the food hubs and to the grower, local growers, um, depending on your you know, uh, applications, I guess. And North Iowa Fresh being um, the only food hub in the region uh, saw about a $25,000 in sales from those school um, schools that received grants. So that was contributed to our overall um, sales was up about 40% this year from last year. So that's pretty significant. Um, we don't know what's happening with the schools and whether they would be purchasing in that capacity next year. It's a little bit dependent, of course, on if they receive additional grant money. Um, but it did show us that there is capacity for growth in our producers. We did reach out to four new producers in order to supply that um, increase and also 
um, some of our North Iowa Fresh needs as well. But um, that has kind of let us reach out to producers that we've had on our radar that maybe um, hadn't really come into our um, workings of the food hub, kind of give them a little sample of how it all works. But we were also able to really help the schools to um, source from multiple producers all in one spot. Uh, we got a lot of feedback that that was really easy for them, that they had no idea that something, you know, like North Iowa Fresh or Food Hub even existed in the area, that they'd been interested in local food purchasing, but that they didn't know how, they didn't know who to ask, they didn't have time to go, you know, buy one thing from one producer and another thing from another. So really, the Food Hub was able to connect all those pieces together for those schools and provide them with the opportunity to make those purchases. And some of them were significant purchases. Some schools were spending $4,000 basically in two months. And um, well, you know, that sort of seems like a lot and sort of doesn't when, um, when you don't know where you're gonna get $4,000 worth of product. It, um, it could be a kind of a cumbersome thing if, if the food hub didn't exist. So that was pretty exciting. Um, there was 13 new school buildings that received local food. So that's pretty big deal too. And like I mentioned, the four new producers that we worked with this year for the first time um, that we were able to kind of fold into our system and hopefully have future sales for them as well as um, for other new producers as we find them. So um, I don't know, is that anything else I missed or you have questions that I didn't mention? Those are kind of the highlights, I guess. Yeah. I think that's I know it's what we talked about. We talk about a lot about the um, increase in sales. And obviously, farm to school has been like blown up this fall in such a great way. Um, with the hopes of continuing that. But yeah, it's great to hear that being able to pivot and um, bring in those new producers too. I know we talk a lot about that, like the supply and demand issue with, within North Iowa an uncertainty whether um, we'd be able to even re meet demand, but that producers were able to step up and fill out those gaps was really exciting, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess the other thing I didn't mention is we also expanded into three new um, communities for the CSA deliveries. Um, so we had been doing, you know, kind of a core loop around North Iowa. And this year we um, included Forest City and Hampton and Sheffield as kind of like um, satellite drop-off locations. Um, we worked with a couple of individuals, Marie being one, um, that helped us to get product kind of off our regular route and down to Hampton. And then um, we had a gal working or helping us all to, uh, to do the Forest City loop, loop where she would pick up and garner and take the boxes for us up to Forest City. So we kind of did that in order to um, test the markets up there. For sure, Forest City had quite a bit of um, interest in their area and um, Hampton Sheffield, not as much. We're gonna have to work on that area a little more to make it, um, if, if we're gonna deliver there next year to make it viable. But um, I think there is interest in these smaller communities because they don't have as much access to healthy farmers markets and our diversity at their farmers markets. So I think us being able to bring deliveries into the smaller communities can be a very valuable way for them to get local products that they otherwise don't have good access to. So I didn't talk anything, I guess, other than schools, I didn't really talk anything about the wholesale. We aren't doing a, a, a lot of wholesale. We sell to Simply Nourished, of course, and Mere Cafe. But this year was also the first year um, that since we started that High V came to us begging for products, basically. So that was pretty exciting because we didn't, we've kind of gone away from doing um, High V's so much because just it, it's inconsistent and we're not always sure if they're gonna buy and we end up having surpluses on the weeks that they don't buy and things like that. So they're very hard to plan for. So we've kind of gone away from planning um, for them, but they did come approach us this year and um, wanted to have local listed in their ad for a couple of weeks. And so we were in the shopper listed as local producers um, for a couple of weeks. And then after that, they continued buying until we ran out of product. So that was pretty encouraging because it's been a little, it's been a long road to get them um, committed, I think, I guess I would say to, you know, 
making space like consistently on their shelf for local products and um they did a lot better this year so that's encouraging i think the mindset is changing and people are asking for it definitely that's cool yeah yeah was that just mason city or any high uh, in particular uh, it was just the two stores in Mason City, although um, the, the Garner and the Forest City store, all, well, specifically Garner, had kind of expressed some interest, but we really, because like I said, we didn't plan for it, we did not have enough product to, um, during that time period to offer to them. I think we could have, we could have sold more to the two stores in Mason even um, than what we had available. So it is something we're address, trying to address in our planning but again, it's just risky because we never, we never know. And we've had kind of situations in the past where we end up with surpluses on off weeks when they, when they don't buy. So, so I don't know, we are going to try and address that better so that we can stay as a presence in those stores. Yeah. Awesome. It's good to be on their radar. Mm -hmm. Cool. I guess we did deliver a few boxes to Charles City too with a backhaul situation with Wendy um, from Joya Food Farm. So when Mallory asked, I realized maybe she's asking about the Charles City High V, but we did in the past, we have sold to the Charles City High V, but the distance to get there and the volume that they were purchasing, um, basically we're losing money every time we went there. So didn't work out. And maybe that's some transition in the future too, as we're building up into some of these producers that are doing larger quantities and we're working with more, a larger network of producers, it might be something where we'd have more product and we might, we might go back to that visit, revisit that in some year, so. So Andy, can you ever get a long range commitment from Hy-Vee as far as them saying, we'll buy this much and we'll buy it throughout the summer months? I mean, are they ever? No, it's really loosey goosey um, huh? with what they'll commit to and then then they'll get, um, sometimes I think they get a surplus into their warehouse in Des Moines and they kind of basically drop ship product up to their stores and they send it up at ridiculous prices that there's no way we can even get close. So then the store has to clear out what inventory they receive from the warehousing, um, whereas warehousing is probably trying to clear out their inventory. So it just, it's been hard to do that. And then like, for example, the Charles City store, we did say, you know, we want to continue coming to you, but we need you to commit to, you know, at least so we can break even on our delivery fees. And they, they don't, at that point, that was about two years ago, they weren't ready to take that, you know, commitment. Um, but I think, like I said, I think there is more of a momentum around local food now and people are asking for it. I think it, it's valuable to the store to have these types of things in on their shelves because it attracts, you know, customers coming back looking for those products. So it might, you know, that's something to grow into. Maybe we were ahead of the curve a little on, uh, you know, we're ready to sell to them, but they weren't ready. And maybe they'll, you know, in a couple of years kind of switch too. Definitely. I think that's a good point is like, I mean, we've said it before, but we'll say it again now we said that like local food in general, it's a growing trend and some things that we try, just people aren't necessarily ready for or the buyers aren't necessarily ready for. And then a couple of years later, um, that passes a little stronger. So fingers crossed with that's high V. <laughs> You know, we've had a lot of community uh, gardens uh, in our county, and I don't know if we ever have enough surplus to, to provide the stores, but how would you go about getting a hold of a local store that may want to get some local produce like that? You just go talk to the store owner or store manager. I mean, in case we did have extra surplus, I'm just asking that question, I guess. But. Yeah, I would think that you would have a food safety consideration. Yeah, with that. Sure. Like they yeah. need to have some assurances that you have um, followed food safety standards and when things are mm -hmm. growing community garden wise I'm not sure that that would be probably not gonna that's farmers markets where you stay with it I think, yeah farmers market direct to consumer is a lot um, mm -hmm. more lenient or like like uh, some of the uh, food banks or places like that would yeah you bet. be uh, welcome recipients of those items mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I would definitely encourage that direction to go to a farmer's market, you know, like a youth table or depending on, of course, the age of the vendors. But I know our farmer's markets are always looking for that type of thing. <laughs> More that's, kind of, that's kind of what my 4-H kids did last summer, and that, that seemed to be, they had pretty good success with that, so I think we'll stay with that. But I was just curious about a grocery store, I guess. Yeah, they want consistency of availability, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, Laura, as a resident meat producer, would you like sure. to share an update from your experience? Yeah. Um, 2020 has been wild. I'll start by just saying that. Um, it, I, if I was just jotting some notes about overall um, just how the year went, and I haven't reconciled my year-end finances yet, but um, we, our, our sales definitely went up. Um, at this point, we're pretty much sold out of meat. I have some random cuts left, um, which I was not expecting, and our direct-to-consumer sales um, increased significantly. I would say last year, we were about half and half, um, wholesale and direct-to-consumer, and this year, um, our, our direct-to-consumer, I, I believe, at least doubled, if not two and a half times what it was last year. Um, so we're still trying to juggle those wholesale commitments that we have. Um, I would say that that's the biggest thing that has changed in the last year is planning ahead. I feel like I am constantly looking ahead and trying to plan for the next thing because um, where I used to be a lot more flexible and after I would fill those wholesale commitments, then I would you know, market direct to consumer and manage our inventory that way. Um, but it's gotten a lot trickier there just because that demand is... Um, is more significant, which is fantastic that people are interested in more local products. Um, but also planning ahead, I have never, I mean, I we've been doing this current style of farming for five years and um, this is the first time I have basically all of 2021 planned already. Um, and I used to plan like a month or two ahead. I have all of my broiler chickens ordered for next year. I have um, their processing date tentatively scheduled. I have all of my processing dates for our pigs lined up through the end of 2021, um, which means I my like farrowing cycles. So the piglets that we will have born in the spring, I already had to line up their processing dates before I even like plan breeding. Um, so it's been just, it wild. Um, the meat lockers are completely booked. Um, I, like I said, I booked all the way through 2021. Um, most of them have capacity through um, like mid year next year, but because I need um, state inspected dates, those, you know, there's only one or two of those at um, our state inspected locker um, each week, and they can usually only take eight pigs. Um, at a time. So I have got all of those dates lined up, um, which just seems, I guess I'm just going to keep saying wild. It just seems strange. Um, but uh, we've also, so in addition, so I guess I should take one step back. We primarily raise pork. We do pasture raised, organic fed. Um, like I said, we this year mostly sold direct to consumer. We also have relationships um, uh, with wholesale restaurants and grocery. Um, and, uh, we have products, we do some value added products with sausages and things that have our own recipes. And so we have pretty strong relationships with the lockers that we work with, uh, to manage and make sure that everything is, um, up to state requirements for those things. And so we do spend a lot of time talking to our lockers and making sure that things are made the way that we, um, need them to be. And, it's been um, a struggle. Uh, the lockers are so busy, it is not their fault. They're working their butts off, but um, we work primarily with the Clarion locker and the Ventura locker. And I wanna say that they're doing like four times the business the second half of 2020 than they did um, in 2019. So just that influx of business for them has been you know, extreme. That's a, that's a huge change. Um, yeah, so we also do um, some value added products in addition to our sausages. Um, I make lard soaps and we have season, 
signature seasoning blends um, that we offer as seasoned meat products and also dry um, mixed packets. And those have also, um, the sales on those have increased significantly. And we've had a lot of, you know, I would say that our returning customers have purchased more, but we've had an influx of new customers this year as well. Uh, mostly still in Iowa, but um, a lot more from Des Moines. Um, we are getting some out of state orders for things that we are able to ship out of state. Uh, and I've been hearing that from a lot of other producers as well, that there's just a lot more interest and a lot of uh, new customers that have come into the scene. And so a common thing that I hear, I know I've talked to Steve about it at length, is how to retain those customers that have shown interest in the local food scene and make sure that we continue to talk to those people after the urgency goes away. You know, people were um, stockpiling food earlier in the year. Um, now they're realizing that they like it and there's some relationship there. So how do you continue to cultivate that? That's something that we're looking toward um, in 2021 is how to up our marketing game a little bit that way. Um, I don't know, Marie, is there anything else specifically that you would like me to talk about? Not necessarily. It was more, it's exciting to hear that, um, that demand that you've experienced and that, um, you know, just the steps of being a producer that's been at it for five years and being able to build your capacity that I know we've talked about before, but, um, you know, your growth and being able to continue mm -hmm. to grow to meet demand. And this year was just mm -hmm. ridiculous mm -hmm. for a while. I do, you that, right? <laughs> yeah, I do wonder, um, you know, because we do have five years under our belt and we have control. So we do fair to finish. So every pig that we bring to a locker is born on our farm. And so I do have that control. If I want to scale up, I'm not going and looking at buying feeder pigs. Um, we look at our breeding herd and plan that way. And I have had um, also a huge increase this year. I don't sell a lot of breeding stock or feeder pigs to other farmers, but I have sold some this year. And um, I do wonder, I've heard from some newer farmers who are relying on buying um, livestock from other producers uh, to raise themselves. You know, they, like I said, I have locker dates already booked before my animals are even born. And so I could see for someone who is trying to start out or is reliant on buying from others, it would be really difficult to plan uh, with just, you know, busyness of lockers and things like that. Um, it's, it's hard to get commitments. And a lot of those people I've heard are relying on wait list, which would make me really nervous. If you've got a pig that's eating, you know, 10 pounds of feet a day and it's getting bigger and bigger and you're not sure when you can get in um it's interesting you know i should mention laura that you know i think this uh thing with the pig and packing well, packing plants kind of not taking pigs that had rock topamine in their system you know this actually kind of started to occur i think back in january february before we even had COVID 19 become a conversation we were checking with lockers uh back in i think it probably was january and february of last mm -hmm. year didn't even know what coronavirus was at the time. Yep. But at the time we made those calls to lockers, they were telling us that we had March, uh, actually February, March of 2021, we're booked up through those dates. And that's before we even knew what COVID-19 was. So this mm -hmm. whole rack topamine situation, what's that feed added to the to, to China, China market uh, wasn't yep. gonna take those pigs anymore. I think that really enhanced the need for the uh, local packers to or I should say local uh, people to do uh, local right. food lockers. And so then at that point, then you throw COVID-19 in there also. And I think all of a sudden you got every every little locker around that's busy as can be. So this uh, this has been quite a year, yeah. It has. Is the rectopamine, is that the... Um, it's what they... that's the, the brand name's Paling, but it's rectopamine. It's a, it's a growth enhancer. It's something that'll enhance not just growth, also gives more muscle to the pigs. And all of a sudden, the Chinese decided they didn't want to accept yeah. those pigs from the United States anymore. So once they said that, then all of a sudden, people like Hormel and, and Smithfield and Tyson and all those people said, we aren't taking pigs from any farms that have uh, racked in their system or paling. And so mm -hmm. at that point, then all these producers 
Mm -hmm. A lot of small producers said, well, what are we going to do? Well, we better start calling our lockers. <laughs> and so that's kind of what happened. Yeah. So that was a big flood of locker business that happened before March 1st of last year. So mm -hmm. quite, a, quite an issue. And then it, it's, yes. It, um, I was asking the, I was having a conversation with Jeremy who owns the Ventura locker recently. And I was just asking him now that we're through that initial wave from those things that you're referring to, you know, he's still as busy as he was with that initial influx. So mm -hmm. I was trying to get from him, you know, is it, is he still getting some demand from the confinement farms that have some overflow or is it truly an increase in local? And it sounds- I would, I would say it's, it's probably local because what's happened there with those uh, large farm operations, they all said, we are just gonna do away with rack topamine. We're not gonna mm -hmm. feed our pigs tailing anymore. Those growth enhancers are just gonna be eliminated. So it's probably still local people that are worried about their pigs not going to market uh, with rack topamine not in their system. And because if they, if they get found to be not uh, compatible, in other words, that, that does get detected as a hog gets processed and their veterinarians are checking that at the scale, they're checking it at the entry point of the pigs coming to market. And if they find that in there, the pig gets tanked and there's mm -hmm. no payment on the hog. So mm -hmm. uh, producers have to be quite cautious about that. But luckily local lockers uh, aren't worried about that. So they can just go ahead and take those pigs there. I uh, get it marketed to people locally. And that's kind of one of the big reasons. It's not just COVID-19 that caused this back backlog of local lockers. Mm -hmm. So that's just another, another little two cents right there. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. And now, yeah, Laura, do you really still? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you're fine. Do you sell any of your products locally? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure where you are, but yeah, um, we sell through, I mean, direct from farm. Um, I delivered today to Simply Nourished in Clear Lake, um, Cafe Mir. I also delivered there. Um, we have a new account in uh, Forest City that is carrying its uh, SIDS. SIDS Quick Stop um, in Forest City is carrying our shelf stable products. But um, yeah, we primarily work with, as far as retail and restaurants, um, Simply Nourished in Clear Lake and then Cafe Mir in Fertile. Um, we don't have a huge herd of pigs. And so, um, you know, juggling that um, direct to consumer and wholesale, that's, that's kind of our focus at this point. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And now there's a Simply Nourished in Mason City. I guess I should say that too. Can't forget about I that. Know. I know. I was going to like say, well, I'm pretty sure you're, you're, you got some for us too. <laughs> Next year. Next year. April 2021. Which is coming very soon. Yeah, no, we still. Go ahead. Sir. There's a lot of buzz about that new store, Melissa. I hope you're ready. <laughs> there is. That is very yeah, true. We're all excited. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's crazy. All the all the people who have been reaching out and, um, you know, there's people that I've known. I, I've only lived here for two and a half years, um, but in that time, I've gotten to know a lot of people. And you know, food doesn't always come up in conversation, and they're not people that I necessarily eat with, so that I know mm -hmm. uh, what's going on. But there are so many families who have celiacs, and um, they're just passionately um excited about the mason city location and um and what that means uh for their family so it's really great to be able to um you know make a meaningful um business that's going to affect a lot of lives so that's good that's awesome good thing. yeah i was gonna say it might be a perfect lead-in for you melissa to kind of share um your update and like why like where the genesis of the store came from and um, what it's going to look like. Sure. Um, so prior to moving to Mason City, I was active in the in the food movement um, in Moorhead, Minnesota. Um, I was on the city council there and I um, city council is very different um, depending on the city that you're in. And I was fortunate to serve uh, in a circumstance which allowed me to be on I automatically got a seat on a lot of important boards um, in our community. And one of those was public housing. 
And so uh, I felt very passionately of ensuring that 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 population in our city would have access um, to good food. Um, and so we started a community garden, the very first one um, at uh, the high rise there. And um, it was very exciting to see all of the, the people living in the building participating in it, but then also um, the bridge that it gave uh, in the community uh, and in the neighborhood surrounding the high rise, because all of a sudden people who were afraid of the public, ho public housing were coming out and being a part of this, this gardening experience. And so I really found that it was um, something that was uh, therapeutic for the people living there um, in that they, they gained purpose in their days. Um, and it really was uh, a collaboration with the neighborhood and um, just seeing that food can bring people together on, a, on many levels um, was, was really exciting. Um, also, yeah, I had I told Laura this before I was paleo for many years. And after Christmas, I'm going back just so you know, I'm, but I'm gonna wait <laughs> until after the holidays. Um, so, um, so I was paleo for many years. I really believe um, in, in clean living. Um, and so this is kind of up my alley. Another, another layer to this onion is that um, my husband is in medical weight loss. So he's a surgeon and he performs um, bariatric surgery as well as GERD surgery. He does a lot with uh, acid reflux. And so he is daily um, really working with patients to develop good eating, um, healthy eating, uh, and he is, uh, he is in some ways, uh, very much, uh, a food counselor, uh, and, uh, along with his duties as a surgeon. And so, um, I, I hate to say this, but one of my biggest passions is kind of development and, uh, redoing a building. And my husband and I were really looking and we're like, well, if we're gonna, if we're gonna actually invest in a building, we need to invest in a business that's going to go in this building too, so that we have, um, we have purpose. We don't just fix it up for somebody else to use. And so this was really a perfect opportunity when this building came up to um, marry these two things together. So um, a passion for our whole family um, in, in many levels. So, um, and of course, Ashley is just a fabulous person. And um, so after she and I actually talked at the very beginning of, of the pandemic, I had never really met her before. And um, she reached out for, I, I'm the president of Main Street Mason City. And so re she reached out for me, to me for help um, with, uh, you know, PPP. PPP and some some different small business questions and some grant opportunities that that Main Street in the in the state of Iowa were doing and so that really brought um, brought our ourselves on each other's radar I guess and so we started chatting and talking and I'm like you know you really need to to bring a store here and I'm willing to make it happen so I don't want to compete against you I want to partner with you. And I guess I wore her down. <laughs> and so, um, so uh, we are partnering through a licensing agreement. That means that we each individually own our own stores, but we, um, we make decisions together. Um, and so she is helping with the hiring process. She is helping with um, uh, all the connections with, with those who are going to be providing food for the grocery store. So any of the things that you found in the Clear Lake store, you're going to find it in the Mason City store too. But we do have a larger footprint, which allows us to expand a little bit uh, in a way that the Clear Lake store cannot. And so um, one thing um, that we will be doing differently in, in the Mason City store is we're going to be um, and actually, well, I think it would work in Clear Lake too, because there are so many people who come um, 
as a tourist and they wouldn't necessarily want to shop at a grocery store. Um, but where, where our location is right on the plaza and right across from the historic park inn, we have the opportunity to maybe try to catch some of those uh, out of town travelers who might not necessarily go into a grocery store. And so we're going to be having a full um, uh, olive oil and balsamic vinegar uh, tasting area. And we're also going to be having an, an, uh, um, a larger wine selection. And so this is going to maybe bring in people um, to just be able to bottle their own um, balsamic, they can taste it, that kind of a thing. Um, and so that's, that's one added element to our location. Another thing that I'm so excited on, Maria and I are going to meet again on Friday about this, along with Deb Lassise, uh, we are going to be having a commercial kitchen. Um, this is kind of phase two. My building is, is happening in three phases. Otherwise, I mean, like, we, yeah, we can't afford to do it all at once. So phase one is the grocery store with tentative opening April 1st. And then we're going to start working now here on the commercial kitchen. And so this is, I, I think of it as a small business incubator for food-based businesses. Um, you guys all know with Iowa laws, if you want to sell something in a grocery store, you want to sell it in Simply Nourished, you need to have it made in a commercial kitchen. And so this is going to kind of expand our ability to have more local food to sell. Um, and part of this will also include a gluten-free kitchen. So hopefully it will inspire some people to become um, the owners of a new gluten-free baking company and so we're just we're just hoping to um have this space for use for small business but also for educational opportunities so healthy Ar harvest can host classes there um cooking classes educational classes um and then also simply nourished will expand into wine tastings and food pairings and maybe doing um doing some educational classes as well. Um, and it, it allows us to have a flexible space for a meet the maker type thing. And so I think um, something that's growing, um, it, it always has been a, a wonderful thing that farmers markets do is you kind of get to meet the person who your food is coming from. And so we're going to have some, some kind of, I hate to say lobby space, but We've kind of got an atrium area and we've also kind of got a lobby area and then this this commercial kitchen space so we really can have some opportunities to almost have indoor food markets so you know in the weeks come you know of of harvest um we can maybe have some sort of harvest festival we also have the ability we're on the plaza and so with the right permitting and questions we can maybe have some sort of outdoor market too. Well, you know, I'll work on the city on that. And um, I just think that it's the location is prime to really um, tap into that indoor outdoor market type thing. So anyway, it'll be fun. And I would love to do a Christmas market as well, different things like that. And I think um, the opportunities are endless. Um, and I digress. That was kind of long-winded, sorry. <laughs> it's very exciting, not long-winded. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, we're all excited. Yeah, we're, we're really excited for you too, Melissa. Look forward to seeing it. Yes, I'm, I'm very excited. If you guys are ever in town or around, just give me a call and I, I'm glad to give you a tour, so. I'll take you up on yeah. that. Yeah, you bet. I low key love following your Instagram right now too. Like oh, okay. the renovation. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, they took down a wall today. That's fun. I know. I kind of think it's fun to see before and afters. And so I'm trying to do my best. Um, now I've got so much paperwork and loan information and whatever. I have to be sitting in a desk for most of the day, but I would rather be down there smashing a wall. So um, I'm trying to trying to balance both projects at once and so we're I'm making it work it's it's going <laughs> amazing I mean as you say multi multi phases but um 
I think the key part of, especially like why it even fits into this conversation today and besides just the general excitement is that um, we always say Mason City is the largest population base in our North Iowa area, but we don't necessarily have a great space to connect with local food besides the farmer's markets. I mean, Andrea indicated it was, you know, Hy-Vee and some of their interests, but depending on the day interest in, in sourcing local, but Simply Nourished and Clear Lake has been um, an excellent spot for access, a regular access point for both our producers and our consumers. Um, so just the fact that bringing a storefront like this into Mason City is huge. Um, yeah. No, I hope it'll be a hub for for all um, foodies and um, and it becomes kind of a, I, I don't want to take away from the farmer's market either. I think that is a, a wonderful thing too, um, but I think that we can help each other grow. So it'll be good. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we talk a lot about farmer's markets as um, business incubators in a way too. Um, so kind of figuring out your product and figuring out your branding and, and kind of building that profile with your customer base and then being able to then have a next step and being able to sell wholesale into a, a space like Simply Nourished is really exciting. So um, the two work, can work in concert, definitely not in competition, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. Yep, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Clear Lake's a great example of that, right? Great, strong farmer's market, strong storefront, so, yeah. And we're excited about the commercial kitchen conversation. <laughs> um, Molly and Mallory and I keep them like, oh, future cooking classes and demos and all of the fun things that can go happen there. <laughs> oh yeah, it'll be fun. And yeah, when I give you guys a tour of the place too, it has its own doors off a parking lot and it's just, um, I think it's going to be great. Um, it's just easy access for, for downtown to be able to have a parking lot attached is, is really a, an oddity. So it's a good thing. Do you have a proposed, I know you said you had three stages or phases, but do you have a proposed opening date? Um, so April 1st is what we're shooting for, for the store. Okay. As long as I can get um, the, the plumber, it's the plumber. <laughs> they're really busy um and they're and so, all really busy <laughs> i know so the plumber and uh, there's plumbing and hvac and electrical and so we're working all through that and so you know when you think about january february march i've got three months you'd think that would be enough time but i it still makes i i actually kind of am getting a knot in my stomach just thinking about it right now so it'll work it'll be fine at april 1st i'm still shooting for that uh, with the commercial kitchen, I think it really depends on uh, Maria and my conversation on Friday and uh, the funding mechanisms that we can get to, to move this forward. Um, yes, I can try to qualify for some loans, but if we can get grant funding and um, Healthy Harvest being a nonprofit really can tap into some funding that I, I don't qualify for. And so um, I think it, it's going to be working together and finding a, a partnership and a scenario that can get it open as soon as possible. Um, I would like to see it open by harvest time of 2021. Um, all of the infrastructure part will be done. It's, it's basically just outfitting it um, that the costs are going to come in. And so um, whether or not we can, um, yeah, we'll, we'll come up with something, but I would love to see it ready, you know, for, the, for harvest uh, in 2021. So we're, I, I, that would be my goal would be fall of 2021. And then phase three, it's a three phase plan. Um, would be the residential above. And so those units will hopefully be done by the end of 2022. Um, we're going to be applying for grants um, and like all the important ones like passed right and after I bought the building. It's like, oh, that was all due two months ago. So now I have to wait for the next grant cycle. And so um, those upper floor housings um, with outside patios and we're doing solar panels and a green roof, and it's just going to be amazing property once it's finished. But uh, we really do need that grant funding to make it really uh, an affordable place to live. Um, uh, and I don't want to overprice 
you know, the market for, for that. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, that's phase three is residential. So, and how great to have a grocery store in your building. Come on. Everybody's going to want to live there, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is pretty prime, right, with the, that grocery store, but also, the, as you say, the plaza has all those great restaurants right there, and, and yeah, Central Park there. It's brewery right down, two multiple breweries right down the, you know, block. I know. I might just <laughs> sell my house and Colorado. move there. Yeah. yeah there you go. <laughs> Beautiful spaces, that's for sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah, definitely exciting step in there. Um, and I guess the last part that, you know, we really just wanted to highlight in thinking about the, the different parts of supply chain and, and really letting us launch into thinking about um, the different perspectives and what our, our supply demand relationship looks like now, but even moving forward and all of our roles in that um, is healthy harvest, again, a small part of it, but we have been working on a um, local food marketing campaign some of you have seen this um, and it's still in its development stages and we're going to cross our fingers and hope my Wi-Fi holds on so I can actually share my screen and I don't disappear. But um, we'll be launching this in this coming spring called Grow Eat Play North Iowa. And um, let me see if this is going to work for me. Um, basically, really highlighting all of the local food experiences um, throughout North Iowa and being able to promote them in a fun and engaging space. So um, even with the question earlier about like, what's your winter memory like association with food? Um, the campaign is really based seasonally, um, highlighting different experiences. Um, you know, if it's spring, sign up for a CSA share, um, join a community garden, um, attend the gathering, um, those types of things going into farmer's market season and picking your own strawberries and apple picking and all of those fun features as well. Um, and we're gonna be doing an interactive like Buzzfeed type quiz so people can put in their different um, personality traits or their favorite color or their season and whatnot. And it'll spit out a, a local food activity recommendation that then connects into resources on how to do those things. Um, if it's a try a new recipe, it'll attach to a recipe database. Or if it's go to your local farmer's market, it'll shoot to the farmer's market um, list in the area. So um, really trying to leverage this campaign as a way to list all of these pieces up. I mean, I think 2020 has thankfully for local food demand um, shown this really great increase, but Laura said it earlier, like, how do we capitalize on that growth and continue to engage some of these new customers um, in, in local food experiences moving forward? So I at least wanted to throw this campaign out there um, to put it on your radar and say it's, it's hopefully another piece that can layer in um, and can, you know, be available to different businesses and partners um, as far as lo local food branding in North Iowa goes. So with that, thinking that 2021 is right around the corner, um, which is semi exciting and also semi terrifying to say, right? Um, Cause you just never know what's gonna happen. <laughs> um, I wanna hear, I mean, if there's ideas from the group or you've been thinking about what does the future look like and how can we continue to work better um, in our local food system and supply chain, um, making sure that people know what's out there and um, just how can we be doing it better? Is anybody like on your new year's resolution committing to something related to local food? <laughs> I have my dog barking in the background. She's really excited to um, eat the scraps that come from the table. So if that counts as local sourcing, that would be her commitment. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a really lofty question. We should get to know. 
I think I'll just throw out, I think we made so much progress in 2020 as a local food community in terms of exposure and showing that uh, North Iowa farmers can meet the call like this spring when there were shortages and, uh, you know, especially on the meat side, uh, I think a lot of real good uh, inroads were made with a lot of customers showing that, hey, we we have a lot available in North Iowa. And I think um, I think looking ahead to 2021, it, it just looks like we have so much opportunity and it's kind of ours to lose uh, as far as momentum. And I don't know if what the exact answer to keep the momentum is going, but I think staying in front of our customers, uh, not losing that over the winter is always a challenge, but uh, staying in front of them, staying in, in touch with those, those customers so that we don't have to start back all over again come springtime when we have a lot more available. But I'm really optimistic about 2021 and really excited about it. Uh, we've made some invest, uh, major investments in uh, season extension and um, marketing, and we, we've got so much going on behind the curtain here at Twisted River that uh, we're really excited for when we can start rolling some of that stuff out. So. Yeah, that's I was. Go ahead, Mike. It, no, I I think it's very exciting to hear, and just the, the numbers Andrew was throwing out earlier um, about the increase in the CSAs. I mean, that's fantastic, and I think uh, one thing to uh, just to comment on what Steve said is, if, from a marketing standpoint, it might be some, you know. Be, be good to get this information out to the public, you know, like early in 2021, just to say, hey, look what your local growers, look what they did in 2020 during this pandemic, helped out people. Um, I mean, I'm just saying some type of a marketing tool to get the information out. Because like I said, I'm shocked that that, you know, of course, in my, I'm in the food business and we're like, you know, we're, <laughs> we have had to lay off 60% of our employees this year, so it's not being pretty in the restaurant business. But on the opposite side, to be able to, to see positive things and, you know, helping the community, I think it's great. It's just marketing and letting people be aware of it. Um, Mike's point about the restaurant and other food businesses that have been hurt, because, I mean, there are so many of us that have had these increases. I mean, that is something interesting to think about because that is a big piece of our local food scene. You know, I don't know if is there if there's something there to focus on a little bit more. Um, I don't really have any solid input except that that was an interesting point and something to keep in mind. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think of any of our restaurants or the fact that anybody can attest to the wholesale side being down and thankfully the producers can pivot, but um, it's, it's the goal that we always have more restaurants local sourcing, but it is not exactly, unfortunately not the case this year. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have numbers or haven't heard directly about restaurants um, being able to share like even 1910 Cafe Mirror um, taste, I think taste is doing a lot of pivoting with takeout meals and um, meal kits and things like that. But I don't have numbers or direct stories from them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure they're really hurting fun. just from, from a sheer volume. I mean, I can't see anybody. Yeah. You know. In the restaurant business making being making money on it you know during this yeah i mean just the cost of like materials alone mm -hmm. is um huge but then the loss of business on top of it yeah yeah no it's important 
definitely an important point. It's easy to get caught up in the positive numbers sometimes, but um, and I guess I, I the, the note I was making before we had that fun um, interruption was when you were saying about how do we capture some of that that story about the local food, whether it's you know the sales numbers um, or just even positive directions and um, growth that has happened because of it being able to get a press release out there um, to our media partners and, and capturing some of those stories and making sure that we include um, our wholesale restaurants and grocers, grocers as a part of that, I think would be huge. And that honestly was not on our radar currently. So. Um, yeah, it I mean, might help them in the future if people see that they're purchasing local food, you know, I mean, yeah. it's a trendy thing. That and then the school thing too. I wasn't aware of that, that they were, the schools were able to get so much produce. Yeah, that's, that's a good, really new. That's that, a good buzz. Yeah, I mean, schools have been sort of uh, slow too to get going, but I think they have so many restrictions of their own and they have such funding and budget constraints. But this, the funding that they received was because of the pandemic. So they received funding um, and I didn't really explain that very well, but the, the schools received funding to purchase local food direct from a farm or a food hub. Um, so um, they couldn't go to like Fairway and buy oh, something locally at Fairway. They had to buy direct from a farm or a food hub. They also received money um, to purchase equipment so they could buy um, additional refrigeration or freezer space or chopping, dicing, shredding equipment you know, knives and things like that. So they could buy things that could help them to prepare thing, you know, local items that would probably come to them as whole items instead of as pre-processed. And a lot of schools are used to getting like baby carrots and already sliced up apples and things like that, that they're not um, used to getting whole carrots and apples and things like that, where they have some work, you know, to get it ready to where they can serve it. So that was paired also with grants to the food hub. We received um, $10,000 grants to upgrade our refrigeration space and get more equipment for being able to handle higher um, volumes of products. So we were able to get some carts and dollies and things like that so that we can move bigger, um, heavier products and more efficiently. And then the producers were able to apply for grants that would help them to better um, I guess, prep and prepare items for school. So things like grading equipment so they could get apples and potatoes and things like that into the right sizes that fit the school's needs. Um, one of our producers applied for a barrel washer um, so that he can uh, more efficiently clean his products uh, faster so he can do more volume and less time. Um, I think it was across the board there. Some of them were applying for things, grants towards vehicle, refrigerated vehicles, um, more refrigeration space or freezer space. And, all kinds of things like that. Anything that would help them to, you know, be prepared to do future school uh, sales and, you know, that kind of thing. So it was, uh, a, that was a pretty crazy session of grants because they all came out and it was almost like, um, I don't know, they all kind of came off out at once with almost no planning and it, you pretty much had to scramble to spend the money as fast as you could. But um, it worked out pretty well in the end, and I think there's a lot of evaluation um, about how, even though it was a bit of a scramble, it's still those having those three parts, the equipment, the food, and then the um, grants for the food hubs and the producers, having those three together um, were, it was like a trifecta, I guess, uh, without any one of those parts, like the other parts may not have worked as well either because um, if the producers don't have the equipment to be able to service the schools, the schools don't want to buy the product because it's not in the way that they can use it and things like that. If they don't have the equipment, if the schools don't have the equipment to process the food, they can't buy it in a raw form, you know, they have to buy it pre-processed. And so it all kind of works pretty perfectly together. And as they're looking forward and advocating for a future funding, they're looking at similar programs that offer like the different, you know, all the different parts to be able to actually make it work together. 
I don't, maybe you guys are already way ahead of me on this, but I just think of the parallel between your situation and Melissa with her commercial kitchen space and um, the grants that you're talking about pursuing, because there are so many opportunities on the producer side. Um, I've looked into a couple myself, but we're not quite at that point of expanding. But I mean, I use the Clear Lake Simply Nourished um, location currently because I don't have my own commercial kitchen. Um, but there is a lot of equipment that I think, you know, if I were going to show growth, which I potentially could after this year, I'm just speaking hypothetically here, you know, are there other producers that would be able to kind of, you know, meld that, um, use like you're referring to with your group, um, to be a benefit I mean, for like the grant? Purchase, purchase things that would be homed at the at the commercial kitchen space that would then be yeah, available I mean, yeah yeah maybe i don't know if how that works with a shared space and um you know if it would have to be one grant application um yeah i think there's probably a lot of opportunities out there i don't know marie um that reminds me about this mobile kitchen um thing the isu mobile mm -hmm. kitchen modular thing um, we had a site visit from them. They came up to see our space. And I mean, we're at our current location. We're not looking to do anything that requires that much food safety. Like it would take a full re you know, reorganization of that space that we have. But um, there's grant money in that program for lots of cool parts of, you know, a processing kitchen that might be something to consider. Well, we yeah. don't have, we have a lot of space. I'll say that it isn't mobile, but, um, but we have a lot of space in that building at 17,000 square feet. Um, yeah. And I think the mo the concept for the grant that I'm referring to was a mobile kitchen space, but now it's not, it's more of a modular kitchen space. So it's more like, um, they're designing, uh, different parts of a processing kitchen that could be joined together in different configurations, depending on the needs of the, I don't know, the producer or the food hub or whatever. So there's like a um, uh, stainless steel counter space with the three part sink for washing stuff. There's, I don't know where they're at with it. Cause there was, there was things that were missing and they've gone back and done some adjustments, but there's different things related to weighing out product and washing and drying and packaging and labeling and bagging and all kinds of stuff. Like there's like, I don't know, a model that they're putting together. And then I think the concept is that a farm could, you know, you use that model to, and take the parts or put together the parts that they need for their individual operation. And then, I don't know, find a grant that would fund a portion of that or something. So I don't know, I am on, so I'm sort of involved. I'm sort of loosely involved because I know it's not something North Isle Fresh is really, interested in right now, but I did have them come up to the site visit and I do have to give some evaluation and stuff to them um, in January. So I can kind of stay in the loop with that and see if it, but it might be something to reach out to. I can't remember right now off the hand, offhand what that gal's name is, but with the Courtney's group. Brie. Brie Miller. Oh, Brie, yeah. Yeah. Because that seems something that would be more viable in um, that type of kitchen space than in our space. But there was discussion before the schools all got their individual choppers like that was that's a big problem like we have raw product that needs to get in a way that it's user friendly and some of the food hub managers group were talking about um whether or not they would take on the processing at the food hub so they could deliver it to them like pre-chopped or something like that and then i know we've had discussion about you know having some sort of a team go around kitchen to kitchen and do work um, for the schools but that, you know, that's not super feasible, I don't think, but mm -hmm. I don't know. There are opportunities, I think, for all yeah. of us. Yeah, I mean, definitely the idea of having a shared use kitchen that could be used to be able to chop, because I know like we had talked about in the fall when NIF has product, but not in usable form in the school, it wants product and has money to buy the product, but doesn't have time to chop that. Like whether it's as simple as chopping carrots or broccoli or lettuce or pre-making salads or any of those like 
even basic processing. Like for NIF to get that license is a lot. For the schools to have time and ability to do those things is not realistic. So like, where does that space go besides ideally maybe a space like this? Um, the problem comes down to yeah, figuring out who owns the stuff, where is it, and how is it funded? <laughs> Not where Just is a it? Small Hopefully problem. we know where it is, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's I actually not it that hard of a problem to fix either. I'm I'm an optimist. I think if, if everybody's willing, there is a way. Mm -hmm. right. I'm just thinking even about the SARE producer grants. Um, you know, I don't know how if there's any um, stipulations with shared use. Um, but I know Steve was able to utilize that and that's available for funding all kinds of things from fencing to, you know, like anything, regional food system or, um, gosh, I don't know. I'm just, I, I was just looking at that here while you guys were talking. And I'm wondering if there's a way to double up and like if producers could apply and, you know, I, I don't know. I think there are, uh, I don't, there is a group or a shared version of that grant, I think. And it, I mean, the biggest stipulation has to be the, the producer has to be the applicant, not like a individual mm -hmm. or like a nonprofit or uh, we're a LLC. And so a lot of times we mm -hmm. don't qualify for those, but we've had our producers um, apply on kind of on our behalf sort of. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not right, sure we made it enough this year, but that is something, those grants, there's a whole bunch of them that are probably worth mm -hmm. thinking about. And so. that's where like this type of group saying that, like recognizing that need and all being interested at the table saying, oh, well, is it a nonprofit that has to apply? Cool, we, Healthy Harvest can do it. Or is it a group of producers? Well, NIF, like, can you mm -hmm. organize a couple of your producers to make a group and apply? Or if it's a you know, a business that, you know, whatever the partner needs to be, but we can all have that shared vision and understanding going into it. Um, yeah, it's just a matter of figuring out the right plan. So, yeah, it would be, but a huge, a, definitely a huge gap that, and, and we, I mean, we're focusing on schools because that was like, the most recent example of one of those barriers that just was frustrating in the way that we had both ends, but the middle was missing, right? But um, that's true of restaurants, value add into grocery and things like that too. There's um, lots of opportunity for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Melissa made the point about the gluten-free bakery. <laughs> that would be amazing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Like some really cool opportunity there. <laughs> Who do we I know? would buy a lot of baked goods. You can tell someone that if they're thinking about it. <laughs> well, that's what whoever decides to do that, if we can get somebody, you know, um, started on that, they have a built in base of, I mean, Ashley and I would both, you know, sell it at our stores. So they would, they would have a market to sell it in, you know. So I think, um, I think there are some bakers out there um, and it's just finding them and, and inspiring them to feed others other than their own family. I agree. Yeah, huge opportunity. Um, so maybe that's our charge for 2021. Find those people that are not yet engaged that see business opportunity or are gluten-free and just want their baked goods or whatever it is <laughs> and continue to grow the system and put those pieces together. Right. Have you guys ever done an ask of like new or like, I guess it wouldn't even have to be new, but I'm just thinking like producers on like, I know you have, that's a silly question, but like what hurdle, what hurdles are preventing them from taking that next step um because like especially you know related around kitchen space that licensing piece of it and insurance and things like that i mean 
it took me a long time to get all of that stuff straight. And then even after I had it figured out, I had to like go back around and make sure that I had done it properly. Um, you know, I don't know. I wonder if some people would come out of the woodwork, like they would really like to, but they just get hung up because they're not sure of how to approach that next step. I really think this is a partnership opportunity for NIAC as well and the SBDC. Uh, and the entrepreneurial center out there, um, they actually do have quite a bit of knowledge, even in, I don't want to say even in the food industry, but um, mm -hmm. not just with your typical small business. And so I, I really think, um, you know, putting through people through venture school and coming up with a business plan and, and planning like that um, could be a part of that in learning what type of licenses you're needing and clearances and that kind of thing. Um, I know if Ashley wasn't helping me put this grocery store together, I don't, I, I don't know where I would have, you know, I, I did go to the SBDC first. Um, and then, um, and I worked with them, but anyway, it's just, um, it's another asset in our community that I think people uh, don't necessarily think about. And I would actually like to see them increase their culinary arts um, out there and do some sort of offering there um, because I think the um, the community in North Iowa needs more people who are are trained in in that. So yeah, that's an outstanding idea, Melissa. I mean, Nyack is. I, I was just looking at their their brochure the other the other day on the kitchen table that came out, but they, I mean, it's such a great little, you know, apple we have that you know. Are, it's a great resource that we could utilize. And I don't, I mean, I don't see a lot of their, I don't, haven't noticed anything about there are any culinary programs they have, but. No, they I really don't. don't. The closest you, I think is, is probably Fort Dodge. Their community college has a, has a very well-known culinary arts program there, but they're few and far between. Yeah, oh, for sure. But just yeah, there's kind of a few gardening things and stuff like that at NIAC, and, but nothing, I haven't seen much for cooking stuff either. Yeah, they do ethnic cooking. I, I actually did take a Sh Sri Lankan cooking class um, last year, um, and it was very good, well attended. Um, in fact, I think it sold out. And that was at hy V East in their kitchen, but it wasn't well equipped. I mean, like it was very hard to um, get a look at what they were doing and it just wasn't set up right. And so I, I think we have some opportunities um, at, you know, for educational setup that might be better than, than what hy East has. hy East no longer has their learning kitchen too. Oh, really? really? What I did they do? Learned. What well, are they being used for their IELTS program? Uh, yeah. Okay, well, so I already have the ask out to Stephanie, like, where'd that equipment go? Because while it might not have been great, at least it's equipment. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, and it was better than a lot I've seen. But yeah, um, I mean, to the point, NIAC used to have a culinary program. They stopped because they didn't have anywhere for their young chefs to get jobs. So, like, back to the point about being ahead of the curve. Now we always say, man, I wish we had a young chef that was, you know, we could tap into some of these projects. But um, how long ago was that, Marie, that they had that program? I don't know. We're all like pretty new to Iowa in this yeah. group. Does anybody, would anybody yeah. have that? Dennis, any clue? <laughs> Mike, any clue? <laughs> No, no I, I'm, I'm, yep. I'm three yep. years. But what? Never mind. <laughs> Dennis? So. Resident. I spread over here. <laughs> yeah. I just, um, met, I just met with NIAC for two hours before this Zoom meeting. So, and NIAC board of directors deal we had there going. So, didn't say anything about culinary arts there either. <laughs> Mostly farming. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's been an apple that we've wanted to like crack into as far as NIAC and the resources there and just finding the right angle to connect them and show them that there's interest and opportunity in local food instead of just um, like little little bites, but like how do we really tap into one of their departments and get them 
I'm sure well, I think kind having of... having Brooke and Tim Putnam from from the Papa John Center and SPDC mm -hmm. might be one way to go. Um, they're always up for you know inspiring um, new business ventures, um, and so um, if you want to have a call with them, I can definitely set that up. Yeah, circle. We've talked to them in the past, kind of lightly. Um, Tim definitely knows our story, but um, it's always the framing of the conversation can matter quite a bit too. So um, we've grown I also, a lot over time. Yeah, I sit on a board with um, Steve. Um, it's not shirts. It's Steve. Whoever's Steve Schultz. That'd be the president, but not him. Not the Who? president, right? Steve Schultz. Schultz, yes. Yeah, yeah no. That's, that's I sit on a board with him, and I could ask him at my next meeting. He's the campus president. Yeah, I'll I'll ask him. Why not? Go for it. <laughs> Never hurts to ask. That's what I I figure. That's how I live my life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that that would be huge. I mean, whether it's like creating these business opportunities is the way the system continues to grow. So we've talked for years about needing more producers to step in, but there's so many opportunities, right? I mean, if you're talking value add or bakery or any of those steps, huge yeah, opportunities just, with growing. And from the culinary yeah, standpoint fine. from, I mean, there's no, I don't, I can't imagine how, these restaurants around here must have had a very difficult time getting help. Well, I know they did because my one daughter worked at one of them in college break and it was just like, it was the worst summer of her life because she worked there nonstop. She's like, Dad, I worked 15 hours, 12 hours today. I was like, oh, now you know how I feel. <laughs> I kind of loved watching it, but you know, the poor kid, you know, she's here in Clear Lake for the summer. She wants to be out on the lake in the water with her friends. She was at the restaurant. All, all summer. Yeah, huge opportunity there. Yeah, well, I think that's a great like nugget of a, I don't know if it's a project or just a nugget of a conversation to have a goal of digging into in 2021 for sure. And weaving it into all of the pieces. Um, I recognize that it's 5.04 and I, Hate keeping people past your commitments because I'm sure that you all have uh, it's already gotten dark on us right I'll have a good evening ahead of you but um, the coalition in general will have our core team meet and and kind of develop our schedule for the 2021 um, year but look forward to quarterly meetings love to continue to have you engage and if you're interested in that core um, team discussion I'd love to have you anybody join in that as well um, Besides that, we'll probably look at March. And as always, can always throw things out to the group and email and stay connected as far as some of these other conversations and ideas develop too. So, and I'd love, I'd love to give you guys a tour of the building as well. I've been texting with Steve and I'm, I'm gonna be giving him a tour on Friday. So if you guys are in Mason City and you want a tour, um, let me know, just reach out. On Friday. Um, if you wanna, if you want to on Friday, that works at one o'clock. I Steve is coming to the building. If that works for you, it actually does. Oh, okay. Um, I'm, I'm just curious to, to see it, and I'm going to be amazing. Um, I'll reach out to you. You are you? Is your email on the link? Or on the my email is on the link and. Um, and you can find me on Facebook um, as well. Um, but my email should be on the on the email that went out to everybody, unless you blind copied everybody. Because what I was going to say, Melissa, I'm looking at the the agenda here. We hopefully by June we could have an outdoor meeting and do a little wine tasting in your in the in your patio out there. That <laughs> that would be wonderful. You know. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Yes. Um, if it's not in your email, um, Mike, I can I can send you Melissa's contact and make sure and connect you to the email. Make sure you got that. Okay, um, I gotta look at my schedule. Yeah. It sounds fun. Yeah, yeah. If you're, if my, my dog has. A, there's a funny thing. My dog has a, an appointment at Fur Babies 
at twelve thirty. So <laughs> I took a half day off to get him for his spa day. You know. That sounds good. The other thing that I'm I'm gonna do uh, with the store too. Speaking of dogs, is make it be uh, a dog friendly um, grocery Ooh. store. And so I know that some people might, you know, it's either oh you're banishing some people from your store. That doesn't mean that I'm gonna have a zoo. But it, it means that if you're out walking your dog and you need some milk, you can come in with your dog. You know, um, being in a downtown location, I think it's going to be like a little bit like a convenience store and you can you can walk your dog and, and pick up your groceries at the same time. So um, so that's kind of on the down low. I'm not going to like say all dogs welcome or whatever, but, you know, um, I'll, I'll have it have it out there. People will know that we're a dog. Your regulars store. will know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. So we'll do the water That's dish awesome. outside and the, you know, the little fun little tie up too. It'll, it'll be good. I can't even tell you how many times I've like walked to the post office and then I'm like, oh no, but I can't actually get inside and get my mail. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't work. So That's so appreciated. That's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Well, um, I put it in the notes as far as Melissa, your your open invitation for a a tour of the space. And hopefully by April, we can all just be together again and hang out in the store. Maybe at least by next. Hopefully by June. Yeah. Probably not till June. Probably June. Yeah. Pick one. Meet on on the plaza. That's safe, right? (laughs) But Thank you all for your time and your energy and all the pieces that you bring to the local food system. It's so inspiring and exciting to get to have these chats for sure. All right. Take care, folks. Have a good night. Thank good you. Good Happy holidays. You Take care. Yes. Have a great holiday. <laughs> Bye.